We have been looking forward to hearing from Brother Sam Robeson once again. Brother Robeson will help us to make use of Jehovah's provision for refuge. Let us listen closely as Brother Robeson speaks to us on the subject, Our Spiritual Paradise, Jehovah's Provision for Refuge. It's highly prized. Being without it spells eternal death. The world will never be able to enter into it. They can't see it. They can't fathom it. Of all the planet, only Jehovah's Witnesses have it. And they have the most wonderful privilege of helping others to enjoy it as well. But what is it? It's our spiritual paradise. Jehovah's provision for refuge. That's what we have. My wife and I are in Patterson, Bethel, and there's Walk Hill, and there's Brooklyn. Uh, no matter where you go in the world and all the branches, no matter where you go to all the assembly halls, no matter where you go to any congregation of Jehovah's people in any kingdom hall, they're within that spiritual paradise if their hearts are right on target with Jehovah. Jehovah knows we need it. We can't be without it. There's no spiritual survival outside its boundaries. He knows we need that spiritual refuge. The world around us is a very harsh place to live. In fact, I just noticed a bumper sticker some time back, and here's what it said, just following along. Life is tough. Then you die. You would think it's going to be optimistic, but it just went downhill. But that's the way reality is. Isn't that true? So many things all around us. In fact, uh, take a look. Paul describes it, and it's the fruitage of Christendom. And these last days, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. And notice how the Apostle Paul under inspiration gives a description of all the harsh elements with the attitudes of people all around us today. He says, but know this, that in the last days, critical times, hard to deal with, will be here. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, self-assuming, haughty, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, disloyal, having no natural affection, not open to any agreement, slanderers without self-control, fierce without a love of goodness, betrayers headstrong, puffed up with pride, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. And all of that surrounding us, these harsh elements and the attitudes of people, make verse 1 very real. 3.1, but know this, that in the last days, critical times, kalipos in the Greek, that has the idea of fierce, savage, hostile times where it would be very difficult to be a Christian. And also the underlying Greek idea of that is that it reduces one's strength. That's the, an underlying connotation. And doesn't it reduce our strength today to keep up the fight to be a Christian? Uh, constantly we're on a battlefield trying to protect our spirituality. So it can affect us. Jehovah sees the damaging effects of this system of things and provides just what we need, a place of spiritual refuge where we can feel happy, secure, confident during these last days and something the world can't even see or even detect. But now we're fully aware, are we not, that we have a beautiful hope of a literal future paradise. And we're talking a lot about our spiritual paradise today, but think of that hope that we have of a literal spiritual paradise coming. Satan's rebellion is not going to stop God's purpose to have the earth become a paradise like the Garden of Eden. Think of all the scriptures that help us to appreciate 
that this is going to be something Jehovah is going to bring about. Acts 3.21, there's going to be a restoration of all things, including the conditions in the Garden of Eden. Think of what Jesus said to the evildoer. Truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. And that evildoer had no idea about any other paradise but the one in the Garden of Eden. How about 2 Peter 3.13? There will be a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness is to dwell. Isn't that different than today? And there are more and more scriptures throughout the Bible to help us to appreciate this literal paradise that's coming. And think, in the literal paradise, Psalm 37, 9 and 10, the wicked will be no more. You will certainly give attention to their place and they will not be. That will be void of wicked people. But it's a little different now with our spiritual paradise because we have these wicked people all around us. But we're in something they cannot see. What is our spiritual paradise? Well, the English word paradise is related to Greek and Persian and Hebrew words that all carry the thought of a park or a garden, a refreshing place. The spiritual paradise, then, is the unique environment in which Jehovah's people experience Jehovah's abundant provisions for our spiritual well-being. The environment is pleasing to the eyes, soothing to the nerves. We have peace with our Christian brothers who have worked very hard to turn their animalistic personalities into ones like Christ and grow toward the stature of Christ. All striving to be kind and helpful, reflecting Jehovah's beautiful qualities as we're made in his image. And that's our big goal, that's our bottom line, to live in the image of God. Remember, let us make man in our image, so that will be our goal. That will straighten any problem we have out by living in the image of God with his qualities. Now, God's word describes the spiritual paradise as a refuge, well watered. It's a refuge because we are spiritually protected, but this doesn't convey the full picture, just the idea of a refuge, uh, illustration. A bomb shelter is a refuge because it protects. It's built for survival. It's a refuge. But is it a paradise? No, not necessarily. Think of the 33 Chilean miners that were down in that refuge way under the earth. It was a refuge, but was it a paradise? They couldn't wait to get out of there. But it was life-saving to some degree, a refuge. The spiritual paradise is a safe haven, but it's much more than that. It has a healthful, stress-free environment like a verdant oasis in a sun-parched desert with trees providing cool shade in a symbolic way, natural springs, thirst-quenching water, a calm place to meditate and think, an atmosphere that's created by the spirituality of Jehovah's people with his blessings upon them. And it is a paradise because of the way it makes us feel refreshed and serene. And you can see a lot of interesting expressions in the book of Isaiah. And we're going to be turning there, especially to Isaiah 65 in a minute. But just think of, uh, here's a nice little way to remember some of these things. Isaiah is the book. Here are the chapters. We just want to mention this to see how easy it is to remember some of these. 25, 35, 45, 55, 65. 25, 35, 45, 55, 65. And 25, it speaks of a banquet of well-oiled dishes. That death would be swallowed up forever. That God would wipe tears from the faces of people. In 35, chapter 35, there would be sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf. Lame would leap like a stag. The speechless one would cry out in joy. The desert will be joyful and blossom as the saffron. 45 speaks of the established earth. He created it not for it to be empty but to be inhabited 
That's chapter 45. Just a point. And then how about 55? There's where it says that when my word goes forth, it doesn't come back without results. Those are going to be true. How about Isaiah 65? There we see many different expressions that would help us to appreciate our spiritual paradise. Let's think of five ways. Five ways. If you'd like to take little numbers down five points, here's five ways we're affected by our spiritual paradise. And we're going to ask you to turn to Isaiah 65, and we're going to first look at evidence of being healthy and refreshed in this beautiful spiritual paradise. Isaiah 65, 13. And just keep your Bible open there, and it'll save you a lot of time. Unless you're taking a nap, and then nothing's going to help you. <laughs> and it doesn't look like anybody's taking a nap. Here's uh, verse 13. Now notice what it says. Therefore, this is what the Sovereign Lord Jehovah has said. Look, my own servants will eat, but you yourselves will go hungry. Look, my own servants will drink, but you yourselves will go thirsty. Look, my own servants will rejoice, but you yourselves will suffer shame. Now, look at the benefits for the people of God. Uh, did you notice it mentions here that his servants would eat while others go hungry? His own servants would drink while others would go thirsty. His own servants would rejoice while others suffer shame. Well, who are these that go hungry, suffer shame, wouldn't have something to drink? Well, these are opposed to Jehovah's people. Now you know this is the spiritual paradise because the wicked are gone in our literal paradise. They're still around here. Jehovah's referring to both of them. So we have this beautiful feeding program and drinking program, enjoying ourselves in a spiritual paradise with other people floating around all around us in this day and age of the last days. But Jehovah's Holy Spirit is with his people in the spiritual paradise. Jehovah's word is there where we can build hope, a solid hope. And just think of the ransom that we know that guarantees that all of the things that Jehovah says are coming true. He signed a contract with us actually and signed it in the blood of his son. Then think of all of the spiritual water and abundant spiritual food as we mentioned from the faithful slave as they use the word of God. And all of these provisions for everlasting life, it's flowing in abundance and Jehovah's people can enjoy it refresh themselves with it, be happy, healthy, refreshed. And let's think of number two. That was number one. Number two, happy and content. Happy and content within the spiritual paradise. Verse 14 will clue us in. Uh, chapter 65. Look, my own servants will cry out joyfully because of the good condition of the heart. But you yourselves will make outcries because of the pain of heart, and you will howl because of the sheer breakdown of spirit. Here's God's people because of the good condition of the heart. They rejoice while people are morose all around because they have nothing to do with the spiritual paradise. God's people are happy. They're content. They have what they need. They know where they have come from, where they are, where they're going, and the beautiful, bright hope for the future. And like a physical paradise, our spiritual environment is pleasing to the eyes and soothing to the nerves. It makes us truly happy. You look at some of the conventions and pictures of conventions along the way throughout theocratic history and modern times, and you have a feeling of those people with the same spirit to worship Jehovah God. They're in that spiritual paradise. Psalm 34, 8 says, Taste and see that Jehovah is good, O you people, and happy is the able-bodied man that takes refuge in him. So within the arrangement, happiness, contentment. How about being relaxed and calm? Now there's another benefit, relaxed and calm. 
And if you just take a look in Isaiah 65, the B part, latter part of verse 16, and then 17, notice the point that makes us happy and calm. It mentions there about five lines up and at the end of 16, the former distresses will actually be forgotten because we realize we've come under the blood of Jesus. Uh, so we can have a clean conscience. Uh, we can have a fresh start, as it were. And notice in 17, for here I am creating a new heavens and new earth, and the former things will not be called to mind, neither will they come up into the heart. So Jehovah gives us a future. We don't have to live in the past. You can look out of the windshield, not the rearview mirror all the time. You have a hope, and Jehovah God has guaranteed that he gives us a standing if we're loyal and walk in the footsteps of his son because of the blood of his son. Doesn't that give us a calmness and a feeling of happiness? And even when you're going to go on vacation, right? You're going to go on vacation. You know you're going to enjoy maybe a week or two. How do you feel just before you go? Morose, depressed? down, suicidal, <laughs> no, you're happy, you're joyful, right? And there's a calmness that comes over you. You feel relaxed because you're going to get to unwind. Well, you talk about a thousand years to unwind. Look how that should give us a feeling of relaxation, calmness, happiness and content as we talked about there. And just think of being at your meetings, being at your meetings. Is it anything like being at a political rally or a political debate? Think of the calmness and the flow of spiritual food, all unified to build us up, to encourage us. And it really helps us to get the full flow of Jehovah's Spirit. While the sea of man may splash and its waves may come up tumultuously all over the place outside. But at our meetings, there's that uh, contentment. There's that calmness, there's that hope being built up. It's within that beautiful spiritual paradise. And just think of what our brothers produce. Our brothers produce the fruitage of God's Spirit. And it has nine aspects. And we don't refer to any one of them individually as the fruitage because all nine have to be produced to be the fruitage of God's Spirit. Therefore, our brothers working hard to do that. Can you imagine the atmosphere they create so different than the world? We're like trees planted, nurtured, and appreciated by Jehovah, relaxed and calm. Psalm 1. And in his law he reads in an undertone day and night, and he will certainly become like a tree planted by streams of water that gives off its fruit in its season, foliage, of which does not wither, and everything he does will succeed. That's in our spiritual paradise. Our brothers are like trees, calm, relaxed, strong, and Jehovah God has, in a sense, watered them. How about number four, being grateful and excited about the truth? Verse 18 and 19 will give us this picture. In Isaiah 65, 18 and 19, Notice, and by the way, the word E-X-U-L-T, exult, has to do with joy, being joyful. But exult, you people, and be joyful forever in what I'm creating. For here I am creating Jerusalem, a cause for joyfulness, and her people a cause for exultation. And I will be joyful in Jerusalem and exult in my people. No more will there be heard in her the sound of weeping or the sound of a plaintive cry. Can you imagine now Jehovah's creating this joy in his people within their spiritual paradise? And just think of what we get to do that brings us joy. Jehovah's people as a team all over the world are sharing the good news of the kingdom, Matthew 24, 14, Matthew 28, 19, and 20, as they teach people to be learners and taught ones and attached ones to Jehovah God and his Son. What a joy that is to help an individual to become a walking, talking, living, eternal monument to Jehovah God there 
Isn't that a joy and a privilege? Jesus said there's more happiness than giving. And that's what we want to think about, more happiness than giving than receiving. Byington translation there says more happiness than giving. It beats taking. And it does. Because we have that joy that Jehovah is creating within us because we're excited about the good news. We're excited about the privilege and the honor to serve Jehovah God. And what an honor it is. And I have a little experience for you here that's in the way of a letter that shows how excited this one brother was to be able to serve Jehovah as a missionary in Venezuela. But the letter is really an answer to someone who was a little bit skeptical of whether this brother would be happy going to all that trouble to go to Venezuela and help people. Maybe he needed to live his life a little more exciting from the standpoint of being normal. Well, this brother writes him and says, are you really happy giving of yourself like that? And he's pretty skeptical. And here's the letter of reply to his friend who was somewhat not on the same plane from the standpoint of wanting to give of himself like this dear brother. He says, you ask if I was happy and if I ever wondered what I would be doing in this system had I not pursued the full-time service. Yes, I've wondered. I was a straight-A student and had scholarship offers and such, so I really had a lot of choices. There's so much pressure sometimes from family and friends to become someone special, somebody special, a success in life. And that was one of the points, the, do you feel like you've been a success in life going over to Venezuela, serving where the need is greater as a missionary? Have you ever stopped and wondered, the brother writes to the other brother, what a success in life really means? Isn't it supposed to be a person who's accomplished a lot? and feels a great satisfaction over it. You often think of those who are at the peak of their profession, though not many stay there. Most are gone in what seems like a short time. I really was shocked when I started seeing famous, successful people at the height of their careers and realized that they were younger than I was. But if a person is judged as success or failure by what they've done or how happy they feel about it, I want you to consider this. I've given a man in a wheelchair the hope of walking again. Not even the most accomplished doctor could promise him that. I've helped a family become united again after 23 years of separation. All are striving for the same goal now. I've helped a former drug addict straighten out his life and given hope to his wife and little girl. I've preached in high-rise apartments through barrios and jungles that would make Indiana Jones cringe with fear. I'm just saying what he said. I can speak in three languages and teach them something they've never known before. Every lawyer's dream is taking a case and arguing it before the highest court of their country. I have a case that is of much more transcendental importance and have the privilege of taking it before the highest court of the universe. I plant seeds like a farmer, but he can't see his crop keep growing forever like I can. I am a parent several times over, but I lack many of the headaches that family life brings. I save lives on a regular basis, and the majority of my tears are tears of joy. Yes, on top of all of that, I am very happy. When I look up at the stars above the balmy tropical sky and I think of the fact that I am employed not by some greedy magnate, but by the very sovereign creator of all the universe, I am in awe, unlike the awe that any man can feel. I've lived a life more full than many twice or three times my age, and I still have my health, my heart, and an eternity to catch up on anything I might have missed. Nothing in life is sure, but Jehovah and Jesus, their promises are. And they promise to take care of us if we seek first their kingdom. They also promise us joy and happiness in doing so, which no worldly career can guarantee. This old world is a sinking ship, so don't bother painting the smokestacks. Just get out of there while you can. With eternity, you can always do something else later, but the preaching work is something that will never be repeated. 
It is a university with very few applicants accepted. If you want to be somebody, think of that. That's a beautiful reply for that, brother. He wrote that right out of the spiritual paradise. That was his feeling. He was grateful. He was excited. That's the way we should be. We should be a happy people, right? Sometimes you want to tell some individuals, look, are you happy? Well, tell your face. <laughs> people look like they're at a funeral sometimes. Always going down like a hound dog's ears, the mouth goes down. But we're happy people, aren't we? Excited. The blessings we experience. Yeah, praising Jehovah. We have so much that we get fulfillment from sharing with other people. And here's something else. Number five. Where we are, it's peaceful and safe. You see these paradisaic conditions mentioned like in verse 21. And they will certainly build houses and have occupancy and they will certainly plant vineyards and eat their fruitage. They'll not build and somebody else have occupancy. They will not plant and somebody else do the eating. Like the days of a tree will be the days of my people be. Jehovah promises us that these paradisaic conditions are going to continue on right into the literal paradise. But this spiritual paradise, we need to appreciate it even more and how it makes us feel peaceful and safe. Look at that verse 25. The wolf and the lamb themselves will feed as one, and the lion will eat straw just like the bull. And as for the serpent, his food will be dust. They will do no harm nor cause any ruin in all my holy mountain, Jehovah has said. Well, think of, with God's help, what some have changed about their lives. Formerly, individuals with beast-like personalities now have made remarkable changes from a lion, in a sense, to a lamb. Positive results also have come to many who've witnessed to unbelieving family members, even some that seem very unlikely to even respond, one iota. To take, for example, the case of Joyce, a Christian sister here in the U.S. Her brother-in-law had been in and out of jail ever since he was a teenager, and people said that he doesn't amount to anything, never will. Now, because he dealt in drugs and was a thief, a host of other bad things, the list would go on. But so against all odds, Joy says, I kept sharing Bible truths with him for 37 years. Her patient efforts to help her relative were richly rewarded when he finally began to study the Bible with Jehovah's people and made drastic changes in his life. And recently, when he was 50 years of age, Joyce's brother-in-law was baptized at a district convention in California. And Joyce says, I cried for joy. I'm so happy I never gave up on him. Well, look at the changes, people. Look at all the experiences you've heard over the years of people making adjustments in their lives and bringing about then this peace and this feeling of safety unity, harmony, accord with Jehovah's people as they worship and work together side by side. And really only Jehovah God could have brought this about, this feeling of peace and safety within our spiritual paradise of the unity that we see all around us. The OD, organized book on page 166, puts it this way. In view of the many divisive factors who would have thought it possible to unite people out of all the nations and tribes and peoples and tongues? Consider the differences between people of a high technological society and those with tribal customs, ancient tribal customs. Then if you consider the vast economic differences between groups of people everywhere, along with countless other divisive factors, the uniting of individuals out of all the nations, factions, groups and classes into an unbreakable bond of love and peace is a miracle that only the Almighty God could perform. Did you realize you're part of a miracle? 
in New York City, they think the United Nations is there. But Jehovah's people in the spiritual paradise, they're the United Nations with this unity that's called a miracle right there. And think of what Jehovah's people are accomplishing because of this. Seven million and more strong preaching over four million hours as a team every single day. And by the way, in the word team, there's no I. We work as a unit. And that's what Jehovah's people are accomplishing throughout the earth. Well, think about this. Reject anything that might trip you up from being in the spiritual paradise. Reject the false refuges of this world. While Satan cannot destroy the spiritual paradise, he's concocted false refuges to confuse people. Satan cannot deliver the real thing. That's true paradise. He can't deliver that, so he takes substitutes and puts them up as false refuges to try to confuse us away from the real refuge of being in Jehovah's arrangement. And just like in times past, pirates would make fires on a rocky shoal that would fool sailors into thinking it was a lighthouse guiding them to safe harbor, but they sailed right into the rocks and the pirates plundered their ships. This is what Satan is trying to do with his false refuges. Satan wants to do that very thing. He studied us, analyzed us, considered us. Our parents, he's considered them, studied them. Our grandparents, he studied them. He studied man all the way back to Adam. He has a PhD in your weaknesses and mine. He's a professor of analyzation of where he might trip us up. He's doing everything he can. He has weapons of mass distraction everywhere you look. He tries to attract you, distract you, and then extract you from God's organization and destroy you. He has his schemes, his traps, lures, snares, crafty acts, fiery darts, Methodius, Ephesians 6, where he's trying everything from every angle, pulling out all the stops. He'll shoot you in the back, kick you when you're down. He'll poke you right in your simple eye. He doesn't care. It's a deadly situation. Let's contrast between Satan's promises and the unhappy reality of those promises, those false refuges. One, we're going to cover five. Independent thinking. This is what he introduced in the Garden of Eden. He promises that the every man for himself philosophy will bring you real happiness. That was the line he used on Eve, isn't that so? We can see what a mess has resulted from man thinking on his own. The reality is people are not happy, people are unhappy. How has family life developed when we think outside the spiritual paradise? Family life has been destroyed by adultery and selfishness, divorce. Big business exploits the common people. Everywhere you look, problems and people are devastated when they look to the future. Independent thinking is a false refuge. How about number two, human leadership? That promises to reduce crime, you've heard all the politicians, stop wars, create jobs, fix the economy. What's the reality? People are afraid. Wars, rape, shocking crimes dominate the news. Human governments cannot improve people's morals or really anything else in the long run. We know Jeremiah 10.23 well that man doesn't have the ability to direct his own steps. And he stepped into one mess after another and proven that true. Isn't that the case? History is replete with a trail of broken promises by man. Einstein mentioned this. 
the significant problems we face cannot be solved by the same level of thinking that created them. And that's where man is. Solomon put it this way in Ecclesiastes 8, 9, All this I have seen, and there was an applying of my heart to every work that has been done under the sun during the time that man has dominated man to his injury. He's just heard his fellow man trying to rule over him. In an effort to make the world a better place, thinkers from Greek philosopher Plato to German political philosopher and socialist Karl Marx have proposed numerous political ideologies. But what have been the results of that? An article in the journal New Statesman said it this way, We have not abolished poverty or constructed world peace. On the contrary, we seem to have achieved exactly the opposite. It's not as though we haven't tried. We've tried everything from communism to the pure market, from the League of Nations to nuclear deterrence. We fought too many wars to end war, to believe that we know how to end war, and our inner cities look as though there's a continuing blitzkrieg. The article continued, We began the 20th century enthusiastically believing that scientists would save us, and we end it not believing a single word we had to say. Or they say either. Human leadership is left wanting, isn't it? That's why those in the spiritual paradise, obedient to the governments, but think of our leadership perfect. And they will never back down, Jehovah God and His Son. How about another, the third false refuge? Money and consumerism, making money and spending. They promise that you can live the dream, and you end up in a nightmare. You are in a dream, but it's a nightmare. <laughs> Think of uh, Proverbs 18.11, when people trust in money to be able to spend, spend, spend. Look at Proverbs 18.11. 1811, look at this. I'm just going to stop short of a word where people trust in wealth, money, building, security. You know how a little moth will see a flame, like a bug zapper or maybe some other flame? And a moth sees that flame and it starts to just move its wings so excitedly and it'll go long distances to get to that flame. It gets closer and closer and closer and then it gets in the flame and... Bug zapper, it's gone. And this is how people really in their spiritual lives, if they begin to get into that rat race where somebody said it's a rat race, but the rats have won. And if we get into that direction, we could go just like the moth. Because look how much security wealth is going to give you. Look at that in 1810, 1811, I'm sorry. The valuable things of the rich are his strong town, counts on them, and they are like a protective wall in his, there it is, what is that word? Imagination. Imagination. We end up just like the moth and the bug zapper because it's not any real security, right? So it's a false refuge. People are enticed into debt by living beyond their means, pursuing elaborate homes they cannot afford, luxury cars and time-consuming gadgets that are said to assure us of fulfillment and security. And advertisers would have you buy things you don't need with money you don't have, just put it on the plastic. The reality of all of this, in the very end, people feel cheated. The burden of debt is overwhelming. Some stay awake at night just thinking of what they're going to do about their debts. And it seems like a new sign of the times, foreclosure. And so many are going through all of that now, and you see one sign dotting here and there everywhere. And they're hitting record numbers of foreclosures where people cannot afford. And they've lived a dream, but it became a nightmare. Take, for example, a wealthy country like the U.S. During 30 years, Americans have, the last 30 years, Americans have doubled the number of their material possessions. 
automobiles, televisions, you name it, gadgets. Yet according to mental health experts, Americans are not any happier. According to one source, over the same period, depression rates have soared, teen suicide has tripled, divorce rates have doubled. Researchers have recently reached similar conclusions after studying the correlation between money and happiness among the populations of some 50 different countries. Simply put, you can't buy happiness because it's not for sale. I just noticed my wife and I in a restaurant. Uh, here's several tables, and here's a table. We noticed a family of five, father, mother, three children, all had cell phones and all texting someone else. Five different conversations being held in other places by those five men. They were so connected, they were disconnected. Is that bringing them real happiness? Look what's happening to that family. Jehovah doesn't promise that our possessions will last forever. What does he promise that will last forever? 1 John 2.17, Furthermore, the world is passing away, and so is its desire, but he that does the will of God remains forever. So people doing the will of God remain forever. And it's so much better to make people, then, our concern, our real interest, and find joy in doing things for others, and not put our trust in material things. Lead a simple life. Isn't that something that we've been told over and over over? Keep things uncomplicated. Serve Jehovah. Keep our eye on the kingdom, eye on the prize. And a good rule of thumb when it comes to material possessions is this. Live within your earnings and below your yearnings. And that will help us to lead a simple life. So, money and consumerism, not a real refuge at all. How about higher education, number four? Is that a real refuge? It's been put up as such. The promises of higher salaries, more fulfilling life. They say that you can't make it in this competitive world without a higher education. We're talking about a four-year university education. The reality of that, is it a real refuge? Well, people are stressed out and in debt, and many college graduates feel overworked and exploited. Overworked and exploited. Often they do not achieve the financial benefits that they expected. It's interesting, a teacher in one technical school put it this way, he said that 45% of those he was teaching in a technical school so that you can learn to trade and how to find a job that you can do, he says 45% came to him after a four-year university with a degree but couldn't find a job. Now they're trying to train to get a job. The 2005 Watchtower, October 1st, page 29, quoted in... The Time Magazine, January 24, 2005. Most colleges are seriously out of step with the real world in getting students ready to become workers in the post-college world. Vocational schools are seeing a mini-boom. Their enrollment grew 48% from 1996 to 2000. Meanwhile, those expensive, time-sucking college diplomas have become worthless more so than ever. So just having a degree doesn't mean you're going to get a job. But you're going to be happy. It's very interesting what the El Universal newspaper of Mexico City said. Obtaining a degree today doesn't guarantee getting a job. And a recent study conducted in Mexico revealed that between 1991 and 2000, 40% of professionals had to take jobs unrelated to their degree course. This means that 750,000 university graduates are performing jobs that do not require a degree, such as telephone operators, drivers, and bartenders, and so on. 
And the report estimated that by 2006 in Mexico, there will be 131,000 more administrators, 100,000 more accountants, 92,000 more computer engineers, 92,000 more elementary school teachers, and 87,000 more lawyers than there are jobs available in those professions. Very interesting. So many have come to a great feeling of disillusion. Then think of the association when one's off in a dormitory in a university. Drugs, binge drinking, immorality, hooking up. Many have found the cost too high, and I don't talk about just money, but spirituality. Many have lost their spirituality. Some have asked, can my child afford to be without a university education? But the real question should be, how long would my child survive trying to get one? We've received so many spiritual body bags back from universities. And think of another. That was a false refuge. Higher education is a false refuge. It's not the panacea. God's kingdom and leading a simple life, putting Jehovah first, that has a real future. But number five is another false refuge, entertainment and pleasure. I remember in the last days people would be lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. This promise is relaxation. The reality is much of it has little substance and doesn't edify. Many overdo the time spent in entertainment and feel emotionally drained. You know, the average man and woman spend seven hours and two minutes every single day, seven days a week in front of the television. That's what the average man and woman spend. Seven hours and two minutes every single day. Do you realize if an average person just spent two hours a day in his lifetime, that's seven years, just two hours a day. Is that fulfilling? And surprisingly, TV does not even rate as the relaxing pastime that so many think it is. Studies carried out on 1,200 subjects over a 13-year period found that of all pastimes, television watching was the least likely to relax people. Rather, it tended to leave viewers passive yet tense, unable to concentrate. Long periods, in particular, left people in worse moods than when they began watching. Let's just say you're going to relax a little bit before you go to bed, turn on the television. Just relax. First thing you know, if you're not careful, you've seen several car chases. You've seen murders. You've seen all kinds of violence, houses blown up, people's heads blown off. Now you're ready for bed. <laughs> Calm. But reading, by contrast, left people more relaxed and better moods, better able to concentrate. And then think of some of the subjects today on television and movies. They have vampire movies. What are they supposed to do with blood? There's all kinds of other crazy things attached to that, too. But just think. Now, some of Jehovah's people have started watching some of the vampire movies. Why are you doing that? Well, some of these are good vampires. Oh. <laughs> Good vampires? Is that like the good harlots? And the good murderers? The good pedophiles? See how Satan wants to get in there and just ruin everything? Christians are rightly disgusted by such inventions of demons that run directly contrary to Jehovah's view of the sacredness of blood. So much entertainment is it violent, immoral. You may be watching TV, for example, something objectionable comes on, a terrible scene. Do we change the channel, turn the TV off, or wait till we watch it and then remark how bad it was? And then the damage is done. And much like an Arabic account of an Arab man eating dates at night by candlelight in his tent. He looks at the first date and notices a small worm in it. Throws that away right away. And he checks the second date, looks luscious, but there's a little worm in that too. So he throws that away. He looks at the next date, 
It has a worm in it. Throws that away. Looks at the next one. How many dates is he going to have to go through? And finally, he just blows the candle out and eats all the dates, worms and all. <laughs> the question is, do we blindly swallow down the bad with the good? We should strictly shun sexually arousing or violent movies, TV shows, books. Don't let it affect us. Some of these movies, when the real credits would roll, it would say, produced, written, and directed by Satan the Devil and his demons. <laughs> Some say, you know, I can watch anything. It doesn't affect me. It just goes in one ear and out the other. Oh, a bullet can go in one ear and out the other. It'll affect you. It'll leave its path, its mark. Isn't that true? Things do affect us. Let me illustrate. I want you to not think of something. I don't want you to think of this. Do not think of a huge pink hippopotamus with blue cowboy boots. <laughs> now don't think of that. Put that out of your mind. Don't think of that pink hippopotamus with cowboy boots. Put it out of your mind. What are you thinking of? And it's not even immoral. It doesn't appeal to the lower nature. See, things affect us. Isn't that true? And you can build wrong desires. Just think of taking a handful of pepper and throwing it up your nose. What are you building a desire to do? To sneeze, right? Throw pepper up your nose, try to hold back a sneeze. When people watch wrong things that appeal to the bad situations and the bad traits of our heart, it's like throwing pepper up our nose and trying to hold back a sneeze. We're building wrong desires. Some of our brothers and sisters say, well, you know, really, uh, I've watched this movie, but it, it just has a few bad parts. Just a few bad parts. And you can overlook those because of the action and because of the storyline. It's incredible. And they even recommend some movies with a few bad parts. But is that how we eat our food? You know, maybe it has some bad parts. You ever go to a restaurant, order a nice, beautiful meal, you're starving, and it's piping hot, you see the steam, Mexican meal, let's say chili relleno, beans, rice, beautiful. You're ready, you've got the chips and the salsa, you're going for it. And you look down and some of your rice is moving. <laughs> and you didn't order fast food. <laughs> but now, you've got to remember, that's just a few bad parts. Now, you're not going to eat anything where something that looks like a maggot is rolling around in there. The whole thing's going out, isn't it? And we have to be careful. Satan's trying to get us, hook us. We all need relaxation, right? And you can't just watch Leave it to Beaver and Andy Griffith constantly. But when we watch something, we want to be sure that we're not taking in the bad parts. We want to be sure that we are our own censors. Now you go to a restaurant, you order a meal, and you notice on the plate they hadn't washed the plate. There's remnants of the other person's meal on that plate. You send it back. You don't eat that meal, do you? And that's what we have to think about when we deal with the situation we're talking about here today. We have to be careful. Entertainment should be allowed only when it leaves us refreshed and with a good conscience. Anything else should be avoided. Then think of what Satan is doing with some very beneficial tools like the computer. And he's using the internet more than anybody else. For example, porn, pornography, has increased 1,800%. In the last five years, there are now some 260 million web pages of pornography. And you have to be so careful. It's a good tool, the computer, but you punch in some places, and the first thing you know, you can't even put your eyes on the side because pornography websites pop up. They're ones that will lead you there. 
Pornography now is a bigger business than baseball, basketball, football, all combined. And every second, well over $3,000 is spent on pornography. And the porn industry has now larger revenues than Microsoft, Google, Amazon, eBay, Yahoo, Apple, and Netflix all combined. Is it dangerous? We're living in a moral meltdown. No matter where you are, situations can pop up. We have to really be on guard. You're just walking down the mall, and here's Payless shoes, and here's Sears, and then here's Victoria's Secret. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't think Victoria has any secrets. <laughs> you have to put blinders on today. What a dangerous world we live in. Commercials filled with sexual innuendos. We have to be like Job. What did Job do? Job made a covenant with his eyes, Job 31.1. What was that covenant about? Not to look attentively upon a virgin. He would see women, he would help women, but he would look at them in no way romantically. He had made a covenant with his eyes. And we want to make sure that we have that same constitution. Now, I think that was the point on entertainment. Is it a real refuge? It could be helpful if it's the right kind, relaxing. But in any way, if it's the wrong kind, it's a false refuge set up as a trap by the devil. You and I have to protect our spiritual paradise. How do we do that? We have to protect our thinking. Because when Jehovah sees us, he doesn't see a sham there, a facade. He sees everything we're thinking about and have thought about. Everything we're feeling. Thinking in the mind, feeling in the heart. Jehovah sees that. That's what qualifies us to be in his spiritual paradise. In James chapter 1, one way we protect our spiritual paradise is to reject any unclean thinking. And it mentions in James, but each one is tried and being drawn out and enticed by his own desire. Then the desire, when it becomes fertile, gives birth to sin, and in turn sin, when it becomes accomplished, brings forth death. We have to be so, so careful. Reject wrong thinking. And number two, cultivate wholesome speech. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, it says, Let a rotten saying not proceed out of your mouth. But whatever saying is good for upbuilding, as the need may be, that it may impart what is favorable to hearers. Let all malicious bitterness and anger and wrath and screaming and abusive speech be taken away from you, along with all badness. Be kind, compassionate, forgiving. Remember that? And what we have to think about, what comes out of our mouth, tells you what's in the heart. Jesus said, out of the mouth, the heart speaks. Jehovah sees that heart, and that qualifies us to be in the spiritual paradise or not. What about speaking injuriously of our brother? What about emphasizing his faults? It shows a wrong feeling in the heart. We have to speak positively of our brothers and sisters with wholesome speech, overlook their faults. I'll never forget the experience I read about Michelangelo. Perhaps his most renowned work is when he, from 26 to 29 years of age, 1501 to 1504, sculpted out of a solid piece of marble the great and wonderful work called David. It stands 17 feet tall and is displayed in the Galleria dell'Accademia in Florence, Italy. It's from one huge piece of marble that was absolutely abandoned by two other great sculptors because it had one gigantic flaw in it. But Michelangelo could see something around that flaw. He worked the pose so that David had his left arm raised, hiding the sling over his shoulder, thus creating a void below where the flaw was. He was able to see the beautiful potential of that flawed piece of marble, which resulted in one of the most famous works of art ever, David. 
And here's what uh, Michelangelo said. In every block of marble, I see a statue as plain as though it stood before me, shaped and perfect in attitude and action. I have only to hew away the rough walls that imprison the lovely apparition to reveal it to other eyes as mine see it. Is that how we are with our brother's faults, flaws, imperfections, idiosyncrasies and quirks? Do we look for the good in them like Michelangelo on that big piece of marble with the great flaw? Do we look at the good things of our brothers? It's not easy looking for the good, right? Because the bad just jumps out at you like a neon sign. But it takes effort to look for the good and takes effort to show that we have the right heart, that we say the right things in private about our brothers whom we love. Uh, Jehovah sees our brothers as though they had a thousand years of repair in the blood of his son. And we want to see that too and then look for their good points and emphasize that. And Jehovah will see that in our hearts. That's part of being in the spiritual paradise, isn't it? I think of a time when we used to do pre-convention work and we'd meet at a kingdom hall and all these departments would set up and we'd get ready six weeks in advance for a district convention. You'd hear all kinds of people walking by, just walking by, talking, and you hear things, you're not eavesdropping, you just can't help it. And we met a lot of new people there for, during that period, a number of traveling friends. And here was one sister walking in, and she's with two or three other sisters, and she's describing her husband. Tall, dark, and handsome. And she's describing him as just a stunning specimen of manhood. Impeccably dressed, magnificently groomed. Just totally in control. And I'm thinking, well, I'm going to have to look at him. He must be somebody like Clark Gable. Because, <laughs> you know, we hadn't seen him. And, you know, finally he, he came into the Kingdom Hall because he's going to work there too. And man alive, I thought that sister has two husbands. <laughs> Either that or she's blind because this man is nothing like she was describing. Now, he was tall, but that's all. It, it looked like he had slept in his suit. It looked like Dagwood's hair. And anything but handsome. And I'm thinking, what in the world is wrong with her? And then the more I thought about it, she knew we were going to meet him. She knew we were going to be eye to eye with him. And we would see it. But then I realized that's really how she sees him. Now granted, she has to really work at it. But I, that's, that's the way she sees him. She sees that good. But that's the way we want to see each other too. We want to be able to emphasize the good. See maybe even sometimes what's not there that Jehovah can add later. <laughs> we want to do everything we can to stay in this beautiful spiritual paradise. The conduct. Maybe the only Bible some people will ever read is the one they read in us. And that may spark an interest. And when they see people who don't just profess faith, but possess faith, that speaks so many volumes. What a beautiful opportunity we have to be here in our assembly, a special assembly day. We want to stay inside our spiritual paradise. Look at our theme, if you would. Notice our theme. Psalm 118. Psalm 118. And here we see in verse number 8. And you'll see nine pretty well the same. And by the way, Psalm 118 is 594 chapters from the beginning of Genesis. And after Psalm 118, it's 594 chapters through the end of Revelation. So this is right in the dead center, the heart, and dead center is verse 8. So if you want to tell somebody what they can do to be successful and happy, and tell them you'll show them right from the heart of the Bible, the physical Bible. Because they didn't have verses and chapters and page numbers or anything like that here on the scrolls. But look what it says. Here it is. It is better to take refuge in Jehovah. Well, that's what it's all about. And that's what our special assembly day has helped us to do. What a privilege we have to be able to take refuge in Jehovah God 
The world cannot see what he's given us, that spiritual paradise. They can't fathom it. They can't have it. Never leave it. Never let it go. Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't give out. And if we work hard to stay in it, Jehovah God will reward us with spiritual riches that can't be stolen and that will never lose their value. The dividends are eternal. Yes, we can draw on them now, henceforth and forevermore.